Thank you. Well, I'm here in the Golden Slide Show for the last 38 years. I thought maybe I could escape it today. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to talk about an uh, interesting topic that's called Weather and Climate Engineering, at least I call it that. And, uh, and part of it, it's, uh, I'm, we're talking about, I'm talking about the lesson of learning uh, from uh, cloud seeding, but I'm going to focus on climate engineering since I've been talking the since to the choir on this, if I had much discussion on uh, cloud seeding and that. Um, this is based on a, a position paper I wrote for a, a workshop called, uh, uh, called uh, The Field Problems in the Climate System that was organized by the uh, Frankfurt, Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies in Frankfurt, uh, Germany. And this will be a part of a chapter in a book that is in preparation right now. Uh, this um, topic was rather interesting to see kind of responses I got to it. Um, Gary Stevens in our department, he referred to this, this work as being wacko. Um, Tony Slinger at um, UK uh, referred to it as being wicked, and I'm not really sure what that translates to, actually. But uh, it was, uh, he, he was actually quite interested in the, my position on climate change, even, you know, that uh, uh, that was in this, in this paper. So I said, I, 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 in the paper itself, and I won't do this here, I provide an overview of weather modification as a background for climate engineering. And I call it uh, wonder engineering just to be the same kind of, kind of uh, terminology. So I'm, I am, um, and, I'm, and I'm actually focusing on a subset of the whole geoengineering. I mean, you can get into all sorts of different topics uh, in, in geoengineering, but I'm really talking about um, how we might modify the climate to things like cloud seeding or whatever. Yeah. And some of the lessons there are, uh, you know, we, uh, the scientific community has established a set of criteria to determine that there is a proof that cloud seeding has enhanced precipitation. And for some proof, the seeding effects of these uh, both, uh, there's both strong, that requires both strong physical evidence as well as uh, highly significant uh, statistical evidence. And likewise, I have used for showing proof that climate engineering is affecting climate, or even that CO2 is modifying climate, because I'm the skeptic on that as well, that is whether our current climate warming trends, which seem to be the case, uh, are due to human activity or is it part of the natural durability of the system. And I argue that in that context, both strong uh, physical uh, um, modern support for that as well as statistical support, and which the statistical support is the greatest challenge in, in to determine whether the modification or alterations in climate we're experiencing today is either due to human activities, and greenhouse warming certainly it will contribute to a warming trend, but is that a real strong signal relative to a man? And we have to go back to a thousand years and, and the database is not consistent, it's not very quantitative and so forth. There's a lot of debate on that. Another lesson learned from evaluating cloud seeding experiments, and this is what I was getting at here, is that the natural variability of clouds and precepts can be quite large and thus inhibit conclusive evaluation of even the best design statistical experiments. And I feel the same can be said for evaluating effects of climate engineering or that human produced CO2 is that. Uh, and we, we really don't have an adequate measure of the natural variability of climate. At least quantitative enough to be able to assess whether climate engineering is causing a given response or whether uh, the climate is there in, uh, in, in response to human activity. So recognizing that, uh, and don't you know the domain of climate engineering, where a uh, large uh, natural variability may exist, and this is quite hazardous. Uh, first of all, look at some of the factors that uh, vary in our climate that often aren't discussed very much in climate, like IPCC and so forth. Uh, volcanoes, for example. I consider them to be a major wild card in the climate system. And uh, a, very, a major uh, volcanic eruption distributes the most qualities of dust and debris, and particularly traffic based uh, uh, gases into the lower stratosphere. And these are slowly converted by gas to particle reactions into uh, 
uh, sulfuric acid droplets. These highly soluble droplets scatter solar radiation, thus reducing the amount of sunlight reaching the surface. And a single major eruption can produce a reduction of solar radiation that can last for something like two years, but uh, can also have residual responses like in the ocean this year for any as long as ten years, and in the deep ocean it could last as much as a hundred years, although the signal level actually diminishes very, very much. So, uh, in, in fact, there are some arguments that I've seen there. Uh, Bryson, for example, at the University of Wisconsin that argues that uh, volcanic eruptions are not uh, purely random, which I thought they were, but uh, that they're driven by uh, uh, Earth's uh, sun tidal influences. That influences the probability of volcanoes and lead us into major episodes of volcanic activity. Um, and he argues that this period where we had the Little Ice Age was an above normal volcanic act, uh, uh, activity period in that. So we're not talking about just one volcano being a factor here. We're talking about episodes of multiple volcanoes and during relatively short periods of 20, 30, maybe 50 years or so. Well, I said uh, uh, a number of researchers here, Paul Kirsten being the most notorious, uh, uh, proposed that, uh, well, what you should do uh, to, is to uh, alter the uh, greenhouse warming is to burn SO2 or H2S carried into the stratosphere by balloons or maybe artillery guns or rockets to produce uh, SO2. And he estimates that about 1. Point, uh, what is that, tetragrams of sulfur would be required to offset 1.4 watts per square meter warming by CO2, which would reduce the op optical depth by 1.3%. He estimates that this can be achieved by continuous deployment of about one to two teragrams of sulfur per year for a total cost of 25 to 50 billion dollars. Seems like a lot of money. But look at the redesign of our economy from a fossil fuel based uh, economy and try to figure that out. Uh, that's a small number compared to what that, that, that I mean, the, the overhaul of our economy will be at least 10 to 100 times that. Yeah. Uh, non based uh, economy. The top of state for doubling of CO2, we estimate more like 4 watts per square meter, uh, per square meter. so we're uh, basically upping the ante here from 1 to 2 to 4 to compensate for uh, doubling of CO2, which is what the inferences are for the next 25 to 50 years, I guess. Uh, that. Possible adverse consequences? Well, stratospheric ozone could be reduced. Cooling by seeding in conjunction with major volcanic eruptions could drive us towards a little ice age. And uh, carbon, and then another option that Kirsten discussed, as well as in the National Academy report earlier, uh, that uh, maybe we should uh, seed with uh, uh, soot materials like uh, carbon black, back to kind of Bill Gray's ideas about kind of reducing the intensity of uh, hurricanes. Well, uh, there's the proposal to use carbon black. <laughs> Uh, doesn't scatter solar radiation, it, it absorbs solar radiation, so it depletes the solar radiation reaching the surface, but that, at the expense of warming the lower stratosphere. And this could then alter stratospheric circulations and also ozone depletion. The consequences really aren't terribly well understood in, the, in, in this scenario. One of the advantages of carbon black seeding in the stratosphere is that uh, you, it's less costly because you only have to deliver about 1.7% of the mass of sulfur, sulfur to get about the same cooling effect. That is, through mass, you get a really bang, big bang of the, for the buck using the uh, carbonaceous aerosol. Other proposals deploy uh, somewhat, uh, something like 50,000 meters in space uh, with a surface area of about 100 uh, kilometers squared in order to or produce a solar shield of sun Earth. Uh, at the Sun Earth uh, Lagrangian point, this would be a big reflector out there. Uh, costs of either are very high. I mean, there are much factors of 100 more than uh, the uh, sulfur seeding in that. And of course, in the first one, if you got these 50,000, 55,000 meters, and all of a sudden we find ourselves going into a little ice age, getting rid of those buggers is going to be a real another costly event. Well, back to cloud seeding. Well, we haven't really got into cloud seeding yet in this conference, but let's go back to it because I call it that. That was what I labeled this after overviewing cloud seeding. 
And I suggest one possibility is relic um, uh, off of the ship tracks so that we can, you know, these are ship tracks that are, uh, are these, you know, I've got a point here someplace. Here are some ship tracks, for example, high albedo tracks. Here are some here, here, and here. And these are uh, produced from the affluent from ships which then uh, uh, in, uh, results in higher albedo in those regions. So if we work for the shipping companies to alter their, uh, um, uh, their uh, operations enough to maybe with some of that additional uh, economic incentives, uh, produce a lot of those in the regions of the uh, subtropical high regions where we need cumulus are from. Uh, here's, a, here's an interesting slide that shows something that looks like ship tracks. Uh, but these are produced by sailboats, no influence, and these are um, uh, actually here's a sailboat. Here's one here. You can see that, actually the sailboat in a fog layer, and it's due to the wind tip vortices of the sail generating circulation that produced uh, these uh, streaks and that sort of thing. So it, there's still some possibilities that ship, ship, everything we see as ship tracks isn't induced by aerosols either. Uh, John Latham, who was supposed to be here but had uh, some family problems and that, uh, he proposed uh, generating seawater droplets, sea spray droplets of about one micron size. I'm asking what does that come to in terms of dry particle rate and radius. Uh, this is really critical because if they're quite large, they could add extra GCCN and help in increase the drizzle. Uh, but uh, the idea is to have a pretty small dry particle size that would compete with normal. Uh, CCN. <coughs> and he said he could produce these by a high volume atomizers like the laboratory versions he's worked with over the years, or blowing through porous pipes and that, and, and, uh, but, and that would rise to uh, producing bubbles that would rise to the surface. He claims that the power requirements for their operations would be supplied by solar or wave action, or even wind power. And here's an artist's conception of a so this is a sailboat, actually, utilizing the Magnus effect. These are spinning discs, you know, so like a like a curved ball, you know, you're spinning and they and you, and they get you get lift on these, and you can actually, you know, with a minimum amount of power driving the the spinning power, you can you can actually sail this boat, and at the same time it would be generating through one mechanism or other a steam spray that would be coming out to the top of these sort of things. So he's really looked into it quite a bit. He's got something like two review, three reviewed papers on this subject using uh, sea spray generation of aerosol particles and that. Uh, one, one of the problems of this is that, you know, we have several papers on it as well as other people showing that if you increase CCN and marine strata cumulus odds, you don't always increase the albedo of those, which would be a cooling effect. You get lots of responses. <coughs> yeah, there's a number of responses that occur depending on well, when you increase drizzle uh, or decrease drizzle, it changes the stability of the subcloud layer, and the clouds actually weaken, and so you don't get a, 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 the same optical thickness you think you have. The Kumi hypothesis based on the idea that if you increase the number of concentration of droplets, other things being the same, you'll increase the albedo. Well, if that doesn't include possible dynamical responses, and there's studies that have shown that well, if you've got very dry air over a marine stratic cumulus layer, increase the concentrations of CCN, they evaporate more readily if there are more numerous smaller droplets resulting from that. You get any entrainment of dry air, this dries out the cloud layer, and again, with the liquid water pass decrease, the albedo doesn't increase. And so we're only really just solving that domain of where you might get these adverse or, or more nonlinear responses than that. Mid level strata. Well, mid-level stratus basically are clouds that are essentially in, uh, are considered to be neutral radiatic, uh, radiatively. They essentially uh, emit and uh, transfer as much long-wave radiation down to the surface as they reflect, it's just about in balance. So I'm supposing that, well, maybe we can upset that balance by maybe seeding by day with enhanced concentrations of pollution-sized aerosol to increase their albedo. And at night, by uh, seeding with large hydrostatic particles to send them, send them out optically so they transmit more long-wave radiation to space. And maybe this could be done in conjunction with uh, uh, commuter aircraft or uh, uh, like uh, 
effectively in companies made that does a, a lot of overnight uh, shipping and stuff. But FedEx, right, exactly. Uh, the other possibility, of course, in the super cool stratus, as you all know, if you've got super cool stratus, you can see those with glaciated, glaciation materials and then increase, uh, make these optically thinner to long wave radiation, and that would uh, lead to a cooling effect in that. Cost? I am, wouldn't even begin to attempt that. But it's really quite costly. I mean, there's no question about it. We have to be really in a pack of trouble if we have to go through them. Uh, I said here we could use perhaps commuter, commuter aircraft with uh, the jet fuel built for the aerosols and that, uh, UAVs or blimps and that. Uh, it's got tall enough stacks for some reason, low enough uh, 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 static cumulus basis and that. Uh, perhaps we could build those and put it on. Potentially adverse impacts. Well, uh, of course, there's always impacts on precipitation that could be possible in a hydrological cycle. Uh, local cold temperature extremes, uh, if you clear the, the um, stratic cumulus clouds at night, then that means there's more long wave radiation in space, and you could find that you experience uh, actually greater demands on fossil fuels and maybe actually countering uh, any cooling effects by adding more uh, carbon issues, I mean, more uh, fossil fuels in the air. And then, of course, that's the impact on the hydrological cycle. Cirrus clouds. This one, this one really caused it was a challenge for me. How do you modify cirrus clouds? One of the things that's thought that globally cirrus clouds contribute to warming. In other words, they're basically a, a greenhouse agent. They're not a greenhouse gas. They're a greenhouse agent in that because uh, they transfer uh, a, a lot of downward uh, transfer long wave radiation. You, you know, if, it, if you have a cirrus covered canopy at night, the, the, the uh, the nights are somewhat moderated and not as cold. Uh, they reflect incoming solar radiation, but thin cirrus basically don't reflect as much as they absorb an upwelling radiation. It, the exception being tropical anvil cirrus clouds, which are optically thick enough that they have high albedo cooling effects and uh, absorb upward long wave radiation in that. It, it doesn't seem that standard seeding practices would do anything to benefit that. In fact, there's a lot of counter the responses that might expect. And that Paul DeMott and I had a paper a number of years ago where we increased the concentrations of ice nuclei <coughs> and resulted in a response with lower concentrations of ice crystals because we didn't have as much supersaturation once a uh, uh, homogeneous region took place. And you had an a, a, a interesting response there. <coughs> so you could get these kind of responses occurring in, in serious clouds. Now. I thought about even using Bill uh, Finnegan's idea of using what I called designer ice nuclei. Now, these were ice nuclei that would promote uh, coagulation of ice crystals more readily and maybe thin up and make this serious uh, thinner. But I suspect that isn't probably very practical and and it would, it would require a lot of more laboratory and theoretical work and so forth before we could go down that road. Another, er, uh, another technique, and I think it's probably more promising, is to go back to carbonaceous aerosols and seed serious clouds, uh, light areas seeding with soot or carbonaceous aerosol, which would absorb solar radiation and warm serious layers enough to dissipate the, the serious light layers. Uh, this is what is uh, referred to in the climate literature as a semi-direct effect. The aerosols warm the air, therefore lower the supersaturation effect. The ice in the clouds will actually dissipate. Uh, and so this is kind of an extension of the idea that Watson Houston actually suggested with carbonaceous aerosols and that. Uh, but they proposed that doing it in the clear air of the lower stratosphere. Here I'm suggesting doing it in the clearest layer. Uh, but there's some other, uh, and, then, and this could have a double benefit in the sense that well, the carbonaceous aerosols would also be strong absorbing, uh, which would warm the layer, and that's the indirect effect on that. But by absorbing it, not as much solar radiation reaches the surface, which is also a cooling effect in that. So you try to clear the surface, so more outgoing long wave radiation goes to space. At the same time, try to reduce the amount of solar radiation reaching the surface. But, of course, if the soot gets attached to the ice crystals, then the albedo of the atmosphere clouds is diminished, so that's a countering effect there. Um, in addition, there's some evidence that some particles are, are, are good ice nuclei. 
And but you've got to be careful that what you feed the serious levels with isn't going to produce more ice crystals than that. I must have talked to Paul DeMott about it, and he said, oh, that's no problem. We have a hard time engineering the uh, carbonaceous aerosol, so they will be effective ice nuclei. Um, the reverse, what you said, would be really easy. Okay, that sounds good. Possible adverse consequences. Uh, uh, really, it, it's only conjecture at, at this time. This is all pretty much hand-waving argument. But most likely one would be an impact on the hydrological cycle, a global hydrological cycle. In other words, there could be some winners and some losers in terms of free fit. How to proceed? Well, perform detailed simulations of the proposed modification method. Uh, what we need along with that is a demonstrated climate forecast scale that is large enough to be able to extricate the climate modification signal from the natural village variability or the noise of the climate system. And once this predictive skill is achieved, then there's the opportunity to apply advanced statistical methods, like some of Paul Mitnipsky's methods and that, that we've uh, discussed and proposed to use for cloud seeding evaluation, and uh, do the same sort of thing with model-based uh, statistics along with uh, observable statistics and that. Unexpected desire, undesirable consequences of climate engineering. Well, uh, Alan Roebuck has just written a paper and uh, might not even be out in press yet, where he's listed, uh, listed something like 18 or so different reasons why we shouldn't do <coughs> climate engineering. And this is part one. And one of them, of course, is the operation of precipitation, which I mentioned. Uh, it could be an influence on ocean acidification. Ozone depletion, especially stratosphere seeding and that. Effects on the biosphere, enhanced acid precipitation possible. Effects on serious clouds. That's, uh, but of course I said, suggest you go on that route. Uh, whitening of the sky, the sky would appear more white uh, because of the scattering and that. That's seen under volcanic eruptions and that. Uh, less coloration for solar power and uh, I'd say demands on uh, heating as well. <coughs> rapid warming when it stops, how uh, rapidly could affect the stop, and I environmental impacts of aerosol injection, and of course, human error and plugging up the system of that. Uh, some unexpected consequences, you know, when you think of all the history of where we've introduced species uh, to try to eradicate one problem, and all of a sudden that became the problem. Uh, schemes perceived to work with less or less and will lessen the incentive to mitigate greenhouse gas warming is a kind of political thing where if you think you can uh, modify the climate, well, let's not worry about trying to reduce our emissions and that. Uh, use of technology for military purposes, he was kind of got into that bang one, I guess. Uh, commercial control of technology, this is a violate some tree. Um, and what, I think this is one regarding use of military use of this. And that. Would it be tremendously expensive, it would be tremendously expensive even if it works, you know, whose hand would be on the thermostat? And this would get into the political uh, uh, political decision-making process. I uh, <coughs> suggested that we form an intergovernmental panel on climate change modification. <laughs> Playing on the word IT, uh, on this IPCC uh, Who has the moral right to adversely modify the global climate? Recommendations? Well, I recommend that we implement major initiatives in climate engineering design using the most advanced models throughout the world. Before implementation of private climate engineering can be done, fundamental research is needed to advance our quantitative understanding of the climate system, <coughs> of climate variability, the scientific possibilities of climate engineering, technical requirements, social impacts, political and political structures needed for its implementation. I think that the weather modification community should embrace climate engineering and perhaps use it as leverage for a new federally funded research program on both weather and climate engineering. Something to consider. <coughs> Why climate engineering? I think this should be considered a last gas measure. So, and if for no other reason, 
We know from cloud seeding that if a drought or major weather disaster occurs, you know, politicians come out for call for cloud seeding to do something without, in some many cases, without due regard for the consequences. I expect that if we find ourselves in a real climate disaster, politicians are going to likewise call for implementation of climate engineering. And I argue it's important that it be done with the most advanced scientific knowledge and with full understanding of the consequences of our actions. I think that's why it's one. Yeah. I'm a modeler. I don't trust them. Right. That's right. I, I, I mentioned that, that you could probably some people could convert that the amount of ozone depletion, convert that in a number of deaths worldwide due to uh, enhanced UV radiation. That's right. <coughs> <coughs> convinced that the rise in CO2 is due to human activity. I'm not convinced that the warming trend is primarily driven by human activity. So that's, one, that's only one of many factors affecting climate change. And I can give you another lecture on, you know, on all these different influences on climate. And, you know, and that's only one of them. And there's major uncertainty in a lot of these other factors, you know, like the volcanic one. There's no predictability on volcanics. And yet, that could be a major factor. Uh, there's a lot of solar uh, climate statistical studies that suggest uh, strong solar influences. Yet, the physics is really, I don't, I don't believe the physics so far as far as making the connection and that sort of thing. So, the, there's many things that can affect climate. So, so, this trend right now, this warming trend, may be in part due to human activity, but it also may be due to the fact that we're in a period of low volcanic activity, that there are other factors that could be influencing that. So we could see that in overturn. We could see a turnaround and all of a sudden find ourselves in a cooling trend, and yet we're still putting out CO2 at a tremendous rate. Uh, and the statistical studies have been done for the last thousand years. Uh, I, can I really believe our tree ring estimates of temperatures average, you know, for the last thousand years? that are accurate to win the level of, of uh, uh, one degree centigrade globally. Uh, I, I just have a hard time with that. So that's where I'm coming from. Just is the signal really human cause? Just like you have to face with this cloud seeding. Yeah. I'm not ignoring it. Saying, I, I'm just saying that it, it isn't the total thing that, that's influencing climate. I mean, it's just like an alcoholic. It's just drinking isn't the real problem. It's the emotional things that led up to the alcoholic, you know, having problems and that sort of thing. So, you know, we're just, it's really hard to define how much of that warming is due to human activity. So, 
that, that was one of the reasons that Tony Swingle called this a, 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 not a wacko, but it was. Yeah.